Merry Christmas everyone and welcome to my review of episode 2 from the second season of The Witcher Show on Netflix. If you've missed any of the previous ones, feel free to check the link to the full playlist in the description. A warning that this video will be full of spoilers and let's get started. I made new friends, get over it. <laughs> we open up with Yennefer having a nefarious dream. It's of a blissful life with Geralt at first, but then a mysterious hooded person takes her elven baby. She then wakes up, swears a bit, <laughs> and my predictions of Fringilla and Yennefer becoming friends in captivity might be true. <laughs> Phil Evandro shows up yet again, it seems they really like him, they had him in the Vesemir anime as well. We then arrive at the Scoia'tael camp, we see their banner with the three arrows, as well as elven swords which resemble the ones from the Witcher games quite a bit. Then they enter what looks a bit like a Kazakh uh, nomad house and Francesca shows up. She takes out Fringilla immediately and Yennefer says she's an elf? I'm also an elf. I honestly think she's one of the least well-written characters in this entire season and she has some of the weirdest lines. But anyway, Francesca reminds Phil Evandro, who's boss... Every passing day increases the risk of us being found. You I don't thought... need our people anymore, Phil Evandro. And we're back to Geralt and Ciri, traveling to Kaer Morhen. For a moment, I thought that the video game music is gonna kick in. You know, this one? Well, that's not the case, but we'll see other Witcher 3 things later on in the episode. So we enter the keep and we're treated to a whole host of Witchers. In fact, according to Geralt, there are 20 of them. Which begs the question, where do these Witchers come from? Are they all older than Eskel and Geralt? All of them must have been away during the sacking of Kaer Morhen and then they returned back. I think that's the only explanation. And just for reference, in the books there were only four witchers other than Geralt, Vesemir, Eskel, Lambert and Cohen. And speaking of Vesemir, he shows up as well. His appearance is clearly based on the Witcher games and the actor may be slightly out of shape, but nevertheless he is good. And he has a few decent scenes later on, of which we'll talk about more when we get there. Next up, Eskel shows up. He looks terrible. You're alright. I like the hell shit. Because he's been fighting a lesson for six hours, apparently, and we gotta talk about something here. And by something I mean the Vesemir anime. If you haven't watched it, please do so. It's not too bad, and you can check my review about it. It is also considered canon, by the way, at least for the Netflix universe. So if you're watching the show, you should probably be up to date with that as well. The first interesting thing is that Eskel claims that the thing he fought talked like a lesson. Is that a lesson? Walk like one. Talk like one. Sort of. Sort of. Now, the anime opened up with Vesemir fighting a Leshen and he was surprised when it spoke, because according to him, Leshens do not speak. Though you Leshens don't speak, so there's the rub. Thought you said they don't speak. They don't. Then later on in the anime, we found out that this talking lesson was apparently one of the many crossbred and mutated new species of monsters. You know, that was more or less the main plot of the anime. But now the question is, why does Eskel say that? Are we to assume that the natural lessons who do not speak died out around the time of the anime and now the only ones that are left are the crossbreeds who do speak? But then, a few scenes later, Geralt tells Ciri that the few legends who are still around have been here since the conjunction because they cannot reproduce. It hides in forests. There are others like it. A few dying out though because they can't reproduce. Any you come across will have been around since the conjunction. Did Vesemir lie? Did he not tell the other witchers about the mutated monsters at all? I mean, they were there as apprentices where a whole horde of them attacked Kaer Morhen, so something doesn't add up. Also, one more thing about the anime which is both good and bad. The good part is that Vesemir brings up the way of killing Leshens 
that he himself talked about in the anime. You know, with fire? But the bad is that Eskel somehow forgot how it's done and never thought to do it. Six hours in, that didn't occur to you? <laughs> and he was literally among Vesemir's first students. Unless he didn't kill it on purpose, because he had its eggs inside of him. Oh god. Also in the show, Vesemir says that fire is the only way to kill a lesion. Fire through the heart is the only thing that puts one down. Meanwhile, in the anime, he says that there are like five different ways to do it. There are several ways to kill a lesion. Behead it, sacrifice a few of its furry pets, even a few old dryad spells will do. Six hours in, that didn't occur to you? <laughs> but still, I think what they should have done is simply have a scene where Vesemir is teaching Ciri about monsters, and he could have brought that thing about the Lessons with her instead. In fact, there is such a scene in the books, which also explains why the Witchers fight the way they do, with all the spinning and dodging and so on. It's basically because they have to fight giant monsters, and that is more or less what the pendulum training is supposed to simulate as well. And so they could have enriched that with even more newly added lore from the Vesemir anime. But anyway, he then proceeds to be a bit of a prick in his interactions with Ciri. Who the hell are you? And speaking of pricks, we have to talk about Lambert. Or Lamb Chop. <laughs> Good old Lamb Chop. It would seem that Netflix swapped the personalities of Eskel and Lambert around. In the books, Lambert was the slightly younger, more unpleasant and rude type, while Eskel was more calm and tactful. Again, Eskel might be a bit of a dick here because of the figurative Leshen egg inside of him, but um, what is Lambert's excuse for being such a charming joker? Oh, now she's wailing. Oh, oh what are we going to do? My husband won't pay you if you don't deliver a more ahead. And by the way, the actor is doing a good job at portraying Lambert in such light, so, you know, ultimately, I'm fine with it. I'm just curious why they did it. Then, Geralt and Vesemir have a brief chat about Ciri, a couple more references are made to the anime. But remember what happened the last time witchers shoved their noses into the dramas of courts and kingdoms. And we see Ciri's blue scarf from Sintra. I was wondering what that is during the trailers. Um, I swear it looked green when they showed it there, and I thought it was a green dress, maybe Triss's dress, but it turns out I was wrong about that. And then we learn of a major detour from the books, which is that human mages believe that elven mages are extinct. To say I said elven mages were dead. She was wrong or lied. Also, Yennefer doesn't give a shit about Fringilla's dreams. Do you think now's the time to start sharing stories about dreams? Do you really think I'm asking because I personally give a shit? But it turns out that they were quite similar to her own. And we also learn that on Netflix, Dol Blathana is some sort of elven promised land, which they are searching for but cannot find yet, I think. You promised us Dol Blathana. How much longer must we search in vain? Each sun sets on fewer elves. Meanwhile, in the books, that was supposed to be the land which Emir helped the elves reclaim from the north in exchange for their alliance with Nilfgaard. Which might eventually turn out to be the case, probably in the next season, and then we have something similar to the problem I had with Vesemir, Eskel and the burning of the Leshen. The fact that Philavandro reveals the elven name of Sintra is a cool detail and it was done around the same point in the books. Well tell me, does the white flame intend to hand Zintria back when he's done dancing on Calante's grave? Zintria? Sintra's elven name before it's stolen. But what I take issue with is the fact that Fringilla doesn't know of it. Sorceresses are supposed to be quite well studied and fluent in elder speech, so I find it unlikely that she, she didn't know the elven name of Sintra. But anyway, we're told again that Philavandro is no longer in charge. My people turned to Francesca after I failed to be Calanthe, they needed faith. And what's even more interesting, that apparently elves and humans can crossbreed just fine, but for quite some time something has been preventing the elves from having children amongst themselves. I've heard there hasn't been a pure-blooded elf born in decades. Now, in the books, for example, elves couldn't have children once they are past a certain age. In fact, Francesca herself explains this to one of the kings of the north, I forgot which one, and she literally tells him 
that she's too old to have children. Meanwhile, she gets pregnant later in the show. But back to Geralt and Ciri now, having a discussion over fighting to save lives versus fighting to exact vengeance. We don't kill out of fear. We kill to save lives. Do you understand? And that is a good scene. It ties to the ending of the previous episode, but I think they rushed it a little bit. Originally, it takes place after Ciri has had a fair amount of training and has gained confidence in her abilities. And therefore, the discussion gets a lot more heated. Um, they get into an argument where Geralt refuses to keep training her if she maintains this mindset and she walks away all angry and he chases after her and stuff like that. It's quite the powerful scene, which could have easily been done in the show as well, they simply had to wait a bit. And then suddenly, Eskel has brought a whole host of prostitutes to Kaer Morhen, and we're about to have an orgy or something. Now, I don't know if this is a reference to summoning the bitches. Fuck yeah! Summon the bitches! If it is, I'm almost willing to accept it, but there is just something wrong about Vesemir enjoying himself at the sight of the other witchers whoring around the castle. Eskel found some friends down the mountain. And also, the activities and even the location of Kaer Morhen are supposed to be somewhat of a secret. And what's the excuse? Vesemir is apparently not worried at all because they all drank something that will make them forget the way to Kaer Morhen? He drank too much ammonium for that sting, I reckon. They all did. They won't remember anything by tomorrow. Certainly not how they got here. At least one of the girls is willing to share some more lore about Leshens, and it is once again that they talk. So one of my regular clients, a druid, he was telling me Leshies are giant talking trees. They're beautiful too. So what's going on? Maybe, maybe young Vesemir was simply wrong about them? Or maybe druids can talk to even the non-talking Leshens? Ah, it's a mystery. Eskel tries to punch Geralt in the face and we're back to the mages who share their dreams with one another and explore an ancient structure which has a prophecy or something regarding a woman called the Deathless Mother, who would later turn out to be a kind of mixture between Gontor Odim and the Crones or Gontor Odim and Baba Yaga. Do you desire us? Now, Francesca theorizes that this may be Ithlene herself, or one of the old gods, whoever they are, and suddenly it opens. I swore I'd take care of you since we were children. Now let me take care of us all. We then cut back to Ciri inspecting replicas of the actual swords from The Witcher 3. Then Vesemir appears and conveniently starts talking about what's most likely the same deathless woman, who was apparently a demon? whom the ancient witchers imprisoned. There's also a mention of Deglan from the anime, Vesemir's mentor. And this one, Deglan. He taught me everything I know. And we move on to Eskel, who is plowing that lady from earlier. But in fact, he's the one who is um, giving birth to something. Fringilla tells a story of how she was saved by Emir after being thrown into some sort of prison which she refers to as the Playhouse. And apparently she stayed there for years. After the usurper executed Fergus, he had all of the mages moved to a prison. Playhouse. I was there for years. Then I may have found me. This whole story comes a bit out of nowhere. However, one of the lingering questions I had about season one was why Fringilla suddenly became such a blind Nilfgaardian loyalist. And I suppose this story here is an attempt to provide some explanation, so I'll take it. Then the house wakes up, it's not poised atop chicken legs, but it's still cool. Uh, we then cut back to Kaer Morhen, where Vesemir gives Geralt fatherly advice. And as a father of two girls myself, I can absolutely relate to it. I was hoping she'd do as I say. Kids never do what you say. <laughs> One thing that bothers me slightly in this scene is Geralt's eyes. It's probably due to the lighting, but for some reason they look extremely fake here. But we have bigger issues now, all medallions are humming. 
Meanwhile, the sorceresses are all having different visions. Francesca of Ithleen, who promises her a child. Fringilla of Emir, who seduces her with more political power. And Yennefer of what I initially thought was her grown-up daughter, but she later claims it was her younger self, I think. But anyway, it's all a hoax orchestrated by the Deathless Mother to manipulate them and stir events in her favor. Also, Yennefer has lost all her magical power after the Battle of Sodden. We then go back to Kaer Morhen and the unthinkable has happened. The Leshen egg inside Eskel has hatched or he was overtaken by the Leshen virus or whatever the reason is, he has turned into a Leshen. He grabs Geralt and he sticks his thing into Geralt's shoulder and I thought he was gonna try and turn Geralt into a Leshen too, but um, it did not happen, probably because Vesemir came to save the day. So a fight begins, Geralt and Vesemir go out of their way to capture the Esco Leshen. Geralt uses Irden on the door, Vesemir hooks him with chains, and when they finally do capture him, he grabs Vesemir by the neck, Geralt does a cool Igni thing on his sword and he kills him, and Esco is dead. Vesemir says, you did what you had to. You did what you had to do. And we move on. But I can't move on, so I I'll have to talk about this first. Sadly, I'm not sure what to say. Seeing Eskel die like that leaves a sour taste in my mouth. They did something similar to Ermion in Season 1, if you recall. And you might say that Eskel wasn't a big character in the books, which is true. But he was a bigger character than all of these people who not only did not exist in the books, but they hardly even exist in the show, either. Their sole purpose is to get killed? I guess I'm spoiling the future episodes, but it's not too hard to tell from the fact that they basically have no involvement in anything. So perhaps if Netflix wanted a dead Witcher, they should have killed one of them and do something more interesting with Eskel instead? Maybe develop that part where Triss was sensing a strong magical potential inside Eskel, stronger than Geralt's? Or perhaps they should have involved him with a succubus, now that they're obviously taking inspiration from The Witcher 3. I just… I can't understand why they did it. It's the kind of death that will absolutely not please the book readers or the video game fans, and it will not even cause any significant emotional reaction among those who are not familiar with the lore, because they portrayed him as a bit of a dick to begin with and it certainly doesn't serve any meaningful purpose within their own changes and their own additions to the story, so I don't know, I, I don't see a bright side to it. Eskel was, again, in the Vesemir anime, he was one of Vesemir's boys, you know, one of the first kids that he raised. For him to just see him turn into a Leshen and get killed and then say, oh, you did what you had to, I don't know. And maybe Geralt could have just cut off the appendage that was choking Vesemir without killing him? Or maybe some of the other 20 witchers could have shown up and done something… ah, I don't know. Back to the mages, I guess. Fringilla decides to stay with Francesca to cobble together an alliance between the elves and Nilfgaard. You're going with them. Francesca claims that the old gods want an alliance between the elves and Nilfgaard. I agreed. Then you're both fools. Which, by the way, I predicted as well in my trailer videos. And we're back to Kaer Morhen. Vesemir is spilling his drink, Geralt is talking philosophy to Ciri. Vesemir said to me that the world outside these walls is a dangerous place. Yennefer cannot cast spells, Eskel's medallion is placed on the medallion tree, which was once again introduced in the anime, and apparently at some point a video game witcher has died as well, because CD Projekt Red's medallion is hanging on the tree. There is also a curious medallion next to it, which I'm not sure what it is. I thought it might be a griffin or a manticore, but it doesn't have wings. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. Finally, Ciri begins her training and we're done. It's a neat ending to the episode, if not for the sour taste in my mouth. But there we have it. Tell me what you think of this and thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my supporters and YouTube members 
and until the next video. Stay tuned, be good, and once again, happy holidays.